Well, the fact of the matter is, right, if this was, if, if everybody has an area of interest and expertise, mm -hmm. right? And you should leverage that from everybody you know. Everybody has something. Yeah. If you find it and use it and spread it, we'll live in a better place. And what's wrong with that? Welcome to Lived In by Zoe Therapy Services. I'm your host, Micah Fay, and I'm excited to share with you a community of experts who specialize in helping you feel fantastic. That's what Lived In aims to be, an online hub for DIY wellness, led by the experts and curated by folks who care. In this wellness series, I interview Richmond community leaders, vendors, and healers to empower you with a toolkit, one filled with healthy practices to make every day just a little bit better. So welcome to Lived In, your online comfy couch surrounded by friends and supported by experts. Come on in. We're excited to have you. Hi friends, and welcome back to Lived In. I'm your host, Micah Fay, and today we are here with Mark Newfield, who is a financial advisor, but he hates the term financial advisor. Tell us about that. Well, the, the fact of the matter is, virtually anybody can call themselves a financial advisor. Now, you need some licenses and things to order to you know, buy and sell stocks for clients and things like that, but virtually anybody can call themselves a financial advisor. Okay. The regulation is, is that thin, which then leads to people having a thing about financial advisors and thinking they all stink. Well, they don't. There are some of us who are what I like to call real financial advisors, and that is we actually think about what it is you need and, and figure out where you are and what your current financial standing is. We spend a lot of time talking with you about what you really want and not, I want a bigger house or another car. It's more like, you know what? I want to get to the place where I work because I choose to work, not mm. because I have to work. Mm -hmm. And what that means to you is different from what it means to the guy down the street. It, it, it's something different to every single client. Yeah. Um, so I spend my time trying to get you financially well in the sense of what well means to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then a real financial advisor which is what you and your buddies call yourselves, yes? Yeah, because there's about 70 of us that we, we kind of hang together around the world, by the way. I was going to say, in the whole world. Well, we actually do a Zoom call once a month, uh, and it's it, the whole group is led by a gentleman named Carl Richards who used to write a column for the New York Times. Okay. And he came up with this concept called the behavior gap, mm -hmm. which is directly relevant to the therapy business, by the way, because you'll say you want this financially, but then your behavior is something different. Right. Like you'll say you want financial independence, and then you go buy a Porsche. Well, there are some people who can spend $110,000 on a car and still be financially healthy. Right. Most of the people who do that can't. Right. But they do it anyway. <laughs> so there's this behavior gap. Mm. And there's also this behavior gap of if you just look at something simple like the S&P 500 index. And I know that doesn't mean a lot of things to a lot of, doesn't mean much to a lot of people, but it's a real thing. And it's averaged round numbers around 10% in returns over the last 95 years. Mm -hmm. That's the length of time we have good data. Well, the average investor has averaged a return much less than that. Why? Because they have this big behavior gap. They're selling when they should be buying, and they're buying when they should be selling. Mm. Now, why is that? Well, let's just look at 2008. You're probably old enough to remember 2008. I'm definitely old enough to remember 2008. What happened to the stock market in 2008? It went a crash. Bang. Mm -hmm. What was everybody trying to do? And why did it go bang? Because people were selling. Yeah. Why are you selling when it's going down? <laughs> because you're trying to keep what you have. Oh. Well, if you really, truly understood that in any rolling 20-year period, 1900 to 1919, 1901 to 1920, 2008 to, what is that, um, 2027, you would have an average 10% return. Would you ever sell? No, except your brain gets in the way and says, I'm going to lose everything I have. I've got to sell now. No, you just sit tight. It's actually when it's going down, you should be buying. Because mm. you're buying it cheaper and cheaper, and then it goes up. Right. And it's always gone up. Okay. Now, it doesn't feel like that when you're in the middle of it. When you're in the middle of a crisis, does it feel like the crisis is going to end? No. And it doesn't matter what crisis it is. Does the crisis almost always end? 
mostly. Now, mostly. obviously, there are people that get into crises that don't end, and that's why there are therapists. Uh, but but uh, and even then, sometimes you can't arrest it. But in the investment markets, right. if you look at the actual behavior of the markets, it's always ended. So then, tell me what a real financial planner does in a day. So how do you guide your clients every day? What's the day-to-day look like? Every client is at a different stage of life. So part of part of the beauty of being ADHD and being a financial advisor is every single minute is different. Okay, that's awesome. <laughs> Which is a, 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 it's a beautiful profession for me. And the reality is most financial advisors are ADHD. I think it's, it's the financial advice is the yellow bug light to the, the bugs of financial advisors. But anyway, in the course of a day, we'll probably have several conversations, but one of them will be with somebody who's a prospective new client. Okay, tell me about and that. And they're interviewing us and saying, you know, they're trying to, they ask the same questions you do. So what do you actually do? <laughs> right. I usually turn it around and say, do you want to know how I might be of help to you? Mm-hmm. Or do you want to know physically what I do? Because mm-hmm. physically what I do is actually very straightforward. We gather data. We do a discovery meeting just like any therapist would, right, to, to understand what it is you want. Most of the time, you're telling me what you want. I'm then trying to match that up with what you really need because your safety zone is somewhere between what you need and what you want. Mm-hmm. Below what you need is you're, you know, on the Maslow's ladder, you're out of your safety zone. Mm-hmm. But in any case, in any given day, I'll probably have one meeting like this that is around, okay, what is it you really want? Where are you in life? Where are you financially in life? How do we match up with what you, with what you have, where you are, where you want to be, and some next step that can be taken to move you along that path? Sure. Recognizing that we can easily draw a straight line, mm-hmm. but nobody's life moves in a straight line. And so we, and here's an example. We drew, we, if we were to have drawn up a plan in January uh, of 2020 for a client who was planning on retiring in January of 2021, depending on what their financial scenario looked like, we might have gotten to April and said, that ain't going to happen. Right. And then six months later, we're like, oh, no problem. And 2020 was probably the best test of behavioral financial problems in the, in the world. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Because we went from incredibly good to incredibly bad in roughly 33 days in the U.S. stock market. Wow. And then in 50 more days, we not only had recovered everything that we had, quote, lost. And by the way, you, if you don't sell, you haven't actually lost. You have what I like to call a temporary decline in value, which is true. It sounds silly, but it's actually true. But in an 83-day period, we went from, if this is zero, to minus 35%. Percent mm-hmm. to zero mm-hmm. in an 83 day period. That is nerve wracking for people who have saved all of their lives and are looking at their balances. So, we of course tell people don't look at your balance, but that's not normal behavior. So, so that's one conversation. Another conversation might be hey, I've got a new job, I have this set of group benefits. How should I make benefit elections? Okay. Another conversation might be with a client who's been with us a long time and has accumulated a significant amount of money, and maybe we're in that March period of 2020, and they're like, do I need to worry about this? Should I be worried about it? Or am worried about it? What do we do about it? So I have all of those kinds of conversations, but every single one of them is matching up your money with your life in a very simple statement. Okay. So a real financial pl- planner meets you where you are. Yes. Helps that's you a very find good way to safety, describe it. Yep. In between what you want and what you need. Yep. Um, and then matches your money to your, your living. Yep. Is that true? Yeah. Okay. Very much so. Okay. And, and, and everybody's different. I'll, I'll tell you, I have an extremely wealthy client. By extremely wealthy, I mean his net worth is probably $40 million. Well, uh, That's in the upper reaches of wealth. Um <laughs> He's got an estate plan that's structured a certain way as to what happens with his money when he dies. And there were some moves we could have made financially to, to, to dramatically increase the amount of money he leaves behind. Hmm. And here's what he said to me. It, it, it's a, estate tax planning. and It's somewhat esoteric part of the business, but again, it's one of these neat little things I, things I get to do. And also to talk to people and understand their behaviors. And here's what he said to me. He said, Mark, I get that. 
It makes perfect financial sense. I'm not going to do it. Well. Okay. And I just said, well, tell me about that. He said, well, what you've told me is if I die tomorrow and my wife dies tomorrow, my children are going to get roughly $8 million a piece. That's enough. He said, I don't care to leave them $12 million a piece. If $8 million isn't enough and they blow it all up their nose, okay. $8 million is enough. And I don't care about paying taxes. Most clients want to pay zero taxes and leave as much to their children as they possibly can. That's not his goal. Okay. Yeah. I met a very I'm wealthy... not going to impose my own thinking on that. Right. I met a very wealthy person last night, and she expressed that she paid more in taxes than she needed to because she believed it was her way of giving to the world. So there are people like that. And yeah. there are other people like, I don't want to pay a nickel more than I have to. And if right. I can pay less than I have to, by some other means, I'm happy to do it. I just don't want to be in legal trouble. And there are other people like me who are like, you know what? I've been super fortunate in life. Yeah. I mean, I like the amount of taxes I pay. <laughs> you know, but so what? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I, for one, can remember when my wife and I first moved in together and you're definitely not old enough for this, but there used to be alums <laughs> on Gray Street. It's now a Christian bookstore. Uh huh. It's down, you know where I'm talking yeah, about. I know exactly. If what you know Richmond, about. you know where I'm talking about. And we used to go there once a month and buy two hot dogs and split one beer. Oh. And that's all we could afford. And yes, we walked down there because we didn't own a car. Right. And so I look at this and say, could I have more? Sure. And again, everybody's behavior is different. Mm -hmm. But to me, so what? Yeah. Just so what? That doesn't mean that I don't mind my clients' dollars very carefully and try to maximize their dollars. Right. But again, there are some clients who don't care. Right. Okay. That's your value system. I'm not going to impose my value system on your value system. Right. Now, if I think you're doing something really dumb, <laughs> am I going to tell you that? Yeah, that's what you pay me for. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean you have to do it. That's your choice. So how do you help people that have no grasp of the financial world understand? Because I think for me, I would want homework. I would want you to be like, here are your 10 vocabulary words. Read these five articles. Buy this book. Because I, I have no grasp of, I listen well, to NPR you, every morning and that's it. If you came into my office, good. Listen to Robin Farzad. He's fabulous. I listen, I listen to Kyra doll because he has a beautiful voice and I like the way oh. it sounds. You should listen to Robin Farzad stuff. Okay. He, has a, he has a cool show. He's here in Richmond, by the way. Oh. Okay. Uh, but he was a Wall Street guy, and he has all kinds of different financial people on. Okay. And you could learn a lot. Okay. Um, a, there are a ton of podcasts, and I could point you to a few. Sure. Um, I don't have them in the top of my head. One of them is The Money Guy. Mm -hmm. There are some other ones. Um, B, I keep a stock. A, there's a stack of books that I keep that I hand to clients. C, everybody's different. Right. You're clearly a more analytical person, so I would arrange a set of resources and say, you know what, Micah, go read these things. But what we definitely encourage, like I never put a time cap on meetings. Interesting. I always allow 90 minutes for every meeting I have with a client. Mm. And I try never to be in a stage where if we're in the middle of an important conversation, you have to raise my hand and say, I'm sorry, we have to move on. Right. I try very hard not to do that. It can't always be done because uh, I'm going to devote to your education whatever you need me to devote. Sure. So I might give you a set of resources. There are other people that looks like, you know what? I don't want to know. Mm -hmm. I'm going to focus on what I'm good at. This is not something I'm good at. That's why I hired you. Interesting. Everybody's different. It's the most fascinating thing in this business. There is no way to script how you're going to work with a client. That's why we have a methodology mm -hmm. and not a fixed set of deliverables. Right. We have a methodology. We have a framework. Right. And I work on that framework and I adjust it and tweak it all the time, which partly drives my team crazy because I'm always playing with things. But the fact of the matter is everybody's different. There's no right answer. There is no right answer. Wow. I just learned the word deliverable um, this past week in my other job. Well, I was a software <laughs> engineer for 20 years, and you, that's all you do is deliverables. Really? We were actually yeah. writing an article about This is actually my third software. career. Okay. So, yeah, let's talk about you then because in just hanging out with you before we started rolling, I learned so much about your life. So, please, help me understand the path of how we got from a little boy who dropped out of high school to... Well, I got kicked out of high school, but I wasn't old enough to stay out, so they had to put me back in. Love it. Tell, I didn't even graduate. I, I was just turned 17 when I graduated high school. Okay. And it's a long story. I skipped fifth grade, and, but anyway. Um, I think like a lot of people who grew up in Northern Virginia, my family was fairly fractured. Mm. I mean, by the time I was 16 years old, I'd seen four divorces. Yeah. 
Um, and that had its own little toll, which again, you understand it when you're 63, you, you don't know what implication that has when you're 17. Yeah. Um, but in any case, uh, it was, you know, not a great high school student. I got put into auto shop as I think a way to keep me busy. Yeah. Uh, and the fact of the matter is I got way ahead in every class that I was in. So I would like read all the books and take all the tests and then not show up. Like I would show up on Monday to get homework and Friday to do, take tests. So I got put in auto shop and I think just all that motion, which I understand now that I know I'm ADHD, was fabulous. And so I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to go do. And so that's what I did out of high school. I got a job in a gas station. I was driving an auto parts truck. Eventually, I got a job in, a, in an auto repair shop out in Vienna. And it was really cool. I worked on MGs and Jags and uh, Ferraris and Mercedes. And it just did some neat things. Uh, but I was about 22 years old, and I was working in a shop in Falls Church. And I remember the day. It was cold as hell. And I was working on an old Mercedes, and I was putting a transmission back in it. My hands were freezing. My back hurt, and I was 22. And I went home, and I had this animal house that I lived in with five other guys. And I realized that when they're tapping the keg on Sunday morning, on Saturday morning, to you know start the all-day party, I was at that time I was reading a book by Carl Sagan called Broke His Brain, which is about brain wiring and brain chemistry. And I was like, I'm not exactly like these guys. Yeah. So I was like, okay, what am I going to do? Well, the the woman I was dating at the time who had just gotten admitted, admitted to VCU Sculpture School, which was obviously a pretty big deal. Huge deal. She was like, you need to go to college. You know, you're actually pretty smart. And I was like, nah, I'm just this, you know, I barely got out of high school. And she was like, no, 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 you don't understand. You're pretty smart. And so I did. I started at Northern Virginia Community College in Annandale. And I ended up with a chemistry associates. And then I got admitted to JMU. And I was in the chemistry program there. And some things happened. Um, I ended up flunking out, and then I ended up enrolling at VCU in the English program, yes, um, and then I flunked out again, um, and I, I knew at that time, and I, I, I know why now, but I didn't know then. I love the work and the math work and all the logical nature of accounting, but from what I knew about being an accountant, mm -hmm. I didn't want that job. I feared I'd be in one place doing the same thing all day. Yeah. And I knew I wouldn't survive that. Uh, and so I ended up doing some research. And I was like, and I was doing a lot of technology work on my own. Like I was developing spreadsheets and doing things that at the time were, I realized were fairly technically advanced. Because a personal computer was, I mean, it was a new thing. So I ended up, uh, through the advice of one of my accounting professors, I had a professor who, if he hadn't taken an interest in me, I promise you I never would have graduated, which is why I make large charitable contributions to VCU. I would have never graduated without my wife and without this gentleman. His name was John Sperry. Uh, but in any case, I ended up getting a job with this technology consulting unit of a big accounting firm. And it was called Anderson Consulting at the time, and it was the Management Information Consulting Division of Arthur Anderson. Well, it's this huge business now called Accenture. And it's, uh, I don't know, a 40 or $50 billion business with 500,000 employees. When I joined, it was roughly 1,200 employees. Wow. It was there for 15 years and left right before the firm IPO'd. And it had 87,000 employees. Wow. So I went from this barely graduated high school, barely graduated college, to I was what was called an associate partner in the firm, which is the second highest rung in the food chain. Wow. Um, and I'd done extremely well, but I hated the work. It was one thing when there were 1,200 of us and we worked on these small projects and we made stuff every day. It was another thing when my job was to shepherd a $200 million contract in Dallas, Texas with 1,000 people working for me and mostly talking to the CFO of the firm about, well, our next bill is going to be $5 million. And he would ask why, and of course it was a male, but that's a whole nother conversation. Um, he would ask why, and I spent probably a half a day every single week explaining our bill. And that was so far from doing the work that I enjoyed doing, like actually writing code and building stuff. Yeah. That I was like, I can't do this anymore. Yeah. And so one day I literally just quit. And my wife thought I was nuts. Mm -hmm. um, and she will tell you that was the smartest thing we ever did as a family. I had a nine-year-old at home. He had all kinds of behavioral issues. Yeah. 
I grew up without a father. That's another story. My father left home when I was seven. I grew up without a father. Um, he was growing up without a father. I mean, I wasn't present. And, and, you know, I'm a lot older now, but I realize how important presence is to children. I wasn't present. I just made a lot of money. And we had this big house over here off of Cary Street, and we had two Mercedes, and he's going to private school. We had all this stuff that I certainly never had. We also had saved quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So I was really fortunate. And I've just said, I can't do this anymore. I'm tired of having a headache every Monday morning when I get off an airplane. And I quit. And I didn't know what I was going to do. And I started getting phone calls from my from friends and, and partners of the firm about financial stuff because it was always my avocation. Yeah. And in the meantime, I, I took a job with Capital One. They offered me a huge amount of money and stock options and all kinds of other stuff, and I felt like I couldn't turn it down. Uh, and I did that for a year and a half, and I quit again. And I took two years off. And all this time, I've got friends calling me and asking me for financial advice. And I'm maybe a little slow and not the greatest entrepreneur in the world, but I finally was like, hey, there are people with money who want to pay me to do this. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and, and so that's literally how I got started in this business. Okay. And so, that was 15 years ago. And, and even though I always told myself I was going to quit working at 50, then I'd said 55. And now I'm 63. I don't work. I don't actually work. I go do something I enjoy doing for people who need it done, and they pay me. So who would want to stop that cycle? No one. I mean, it's a pretty virtuous cycle. Well, you talk a lot about your wife, both in our pre-conversation and in this one. So I'm curious. You said you would not be here without your wife. Can you tell me a little bit about her? Well, she's retired now. <laughs> uh, at the time, we were both working in a restaurant out behind Regency called Daryl's. It's Disco Sports now, that big blue building. Yep. But anyway, I was the bar manager. She was the office manager. And this is in the old days before ACH, right? Electronic deposit. So I used to go get my paycheck every Friday. And she's a graduate of Randolph-Macon College. So right colors, but wrong school. <laughs> um, anyway, it's, I tell her that all the time. I'm sure. She is um, a complete extrovert to my introvert. She is as far from ADHD as you could get. Uh, she and her mother were the first people to really get me to realize that I needed to focus and finish something. Mm -hmm. And that something was college. Mm -hmm. And my mother-in-law, who unfortunately is deceased now, was an amazing woman. And we used to clash to no end. She was an amazing woman. But somehow she got the message across to me that, A, we're going to help you, because nobody ever helped me do anything. I've always been on my own. I've been on my own since seven or eight years old, really. And I was cooking my own meals and doing laundry when I was eight years old. And I didn't even know that there was anything wrong with that. That's just the way I grew up. And who knows? If you don't see another model, you don't know. Well, they gave me another model. They gave me a model of, we think you're a good person. We want to help you. You don't have to do everything yourself. You, you can't pay somebody back enough for believing in you like that. Yeah. But that's, and, and my wife has supported me in whatever I've chosen to do. I mean, she was worried when I quit Accenture. You know, I was, you know, making, well, I was on the verge of signing a contract for a seven-figure income in 1980, when was that? 1998. Okay. I mean, I'd worked incredibly hard, like 70 hours a week for 15 years to get there. And her only question was, is this the right thing for you to do? For you? Well, you... Where else can you find somebody who's like, no, I don't care about all this material stuff. I don't care about being wealthy. I want you to be happy. Wow. If, if there's one thing to say about my wife, it's that. So how does being a financial advisor, a real one, impact your interpersonal relationships? Like when you go out to dinner, what is it like to dine with you? I'm... I'm you have to ask my wife that, but it's usually pretty zany. <laughs> I imagine so. But are you also like, mm, that's $6 overpriced. Oh, no, 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 no. I no, can't no. do it. So that's, you know, that's a common misconception about financial advisors. They're going to, uh, I read this the other day in, in, in one of the things that I read for, you know, my own skill building. And, and this was actually around the marketing side of our business. Mm -hmm. And it's like the primary obstacle in, in, in having people call you is they're fearful that you're going to ask them what their utility bill is 19 years from now. I don't even understand why that would be a, f a fear. Because their fear is that you're going to say, I spend too much. 
Right. And you always spend too much. Well, so you just asked a similar question. I do that a different way. So, so Micah, if we did your financial planning, here's what we would say. Well, if you want to get here and you're here and you want to have this level of financial independence, however you define it, you should be saving X amount of money per year. Right. Which means you shouldn't be spending any more than this amount of money per year. Right. As long as you stay within that parameter, I don't care how you spend it. Mm. You want to go buy a Range Rover? Fine. Just don't spend over your limit. Now, if you're spending over your limit, we have a trade-off conversation to make. Okay. Do you want to work longer? Do you want to have less wealth in the future? Or do you want to spend less? Or do you want to try and make more? But I'm not like, hey, <laughs> that entree was $16. <laughs> I'm not paying for anything over $12. No, I'm just like, hey, the bill's 50 bucks. We're okay with 50 bucks. It fits within our spending plan. Okay. I actually, I have rules like that. Like, I will not pay more than $12 for a shirt. I think it's insane. It's a shirt. I will not pay more than $12. And, and that's okay. <laughs> Look, I'm okay with that. But if you're not watching the top line, watching the pennies doesn't matter. Right. Because you can penny your way to, to, to being very poor. Right. Very true. Right. So, so then I do imagine dinner with you would be very zany. I wonder, I think with our therapists here, their interpersonal relationships often can feel like therapizing. And for that reason, you know, when Yvonne's like, how, are, how was your day? I'm like, good, fine. No problems here because I don't want to burden her with whatever's going yeah. on with me. Yeah. Do you ever feel that in your field with your friends? Um, well, we all have our own problems, right? Right. I am not without, I mean, I cut myself a paycheck of <laughs> X dollars yeah. on the first of every month. Mm -hmm. And if we spend over that in a month, I'm having that conversation with my wife about why did we do this? And I'm, by the way, the spender in our family, not my wife. Um, so, you know, first of all, I say every planner needs a planner. Mm -hmm. And I have somebody who looks at my own financial plan. I wow. think it's the only thing that makes sense. I have the same biases and, and faulty mental models as everybody. Um, so I would say no. As a matter of fact, if we are, for example, out to dinner with clients, which some clients I like a lot and I'll go to dinner with them. Some I don't and I won't. Cheers. Um, um, I try actually not to even have clients I don't like. Wow. And I've gotten to the point where I can pick and choose a little bit, which is very funky for me. I've, I mean, if you look at my, you know what a disc profile is? No idea. It, it's a, it's a, a modeling thing about, you know, your behaviors. My humanist trait is my number one trait. I want to help everybody. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is you can't. You don't have that many hours in a day. So I've gotten a little selective as I've gotten older about who I'm willing to invest in my own time because I do care. And so it can be, I guess to your point, therapizing or therapizing or that's, I don't know the even word. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, I try not to. Yeah. I just try and say, look, we're out having fun today. Yeah, I think that's a good boundary. Today to is a time to go have fun. And and like my brother in law likes to call me on Saturday. And I'll just tell him, John, you need to call me about that on Monday. Yeah. Or if you don't mind, I'm gonna take a note and I'll put it in my calendar and I'll call you Monday. Right. But today is Saturday. And we're gonna have fun. Today is a fun day. And like when I walk out of here, I'm gonna go hit golf balls. That's what I'm gonna go do. Yeah, you're dressed for it. Uh, I kind of assumed well, that. I'm kind of dressed for that all the time. <laughs> the, the great thing about our world as it's evolved is you don't have to dress up anymore. Nobody cares. You've talked about that twice now. I love yeah. that. Well, I wore a suit, you know, every day for 20 years. Yeah. Why? What value does this add to what you're doing? Nothing. I wear leggings it's people's every day expectations, of my life. right? It's their expectation. Well, I would rather you expect that I do a great job for you than I look good doing it. Yeah. There's a, it was Billy Crystal on Saturday Night Live. Love him. Right? It's better to look good than to feel good. He was doing Fernando Lamas. Oh, yeah. I okay. can't do the accent, so I won't try. I'll sound even stupider than I sound normally. Um, and I say, you know what? It's better to feel good and be good than to look good. My daddy says, uh, never look like you can afford to be where you are. And the fact of the matter that. is most truly wealthy people don't look like it. Mm -hmm. You'd be surprised. Now, there's certainly the guys. I was in care. I was at Plan 9 Records yesterday. Love that place. Well, I have a ton of old albums that I don't play anymore. I've digitized everything. So I actually sold them 
350 albums yesterday. Wow. But a guy pulls up behind me in a Bentley, mm -hmm. a $350,000 car, maybe more. So some people like to show it. A lot of people don't. Yeah. You'd be surprised at how many clients I have that for what they spend, they are fabulously wealthy. You'd never know it. Right. Right. To me, most of the time, those are the happiest people because they don't care. That's just where they wound up. It wasn't in, now, if you intend to be wealthy and it's important to you to be wealthy and you wind up there, hey, I'm all for it. Good for you. Feel proud. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to judge, but that's pretty common. For really wealthy people, you wouldn't know it. My friend and client who's, you know, 40 million, I mean, if you didn't see his house, you'd never know. If you just saw him in public, you'd never know. Right. Now, his house, it's pretty serious. I imagine. It is. But it, it, it also isn't what he could afford to live in. You could afford to live in something much, much more. So I'm learning that we need to, I guess as my dad would say, live below our means. Absolutely um, spend less than you earn. Spend less than you earn. That's spend really less than it. you earn. That is the number one maximum. If you spend less than you earn, you'll never be poor. So then are there other rules that are just rules? Or is that not really a thing because everyone's different? Well, that, from a wealth perspective, look... If you are okay not having a penny to your name and it doesn't matter to you, then that doesn't matter either. But if you, if you get anxiety when you don't have money in the bank, and how many people that you talk to do? A lot. All of us. <laughs> Most of us. There are people that truly don't care and okay. But I would say for probably 90% of all people, spend less than you earn, right? The other key rule, and it forces you to spend less than you earn, is to save automatically. Yeah. Like every paycheck, some amount of money. Now, it, it, I'm, I'm not going to try and guess your age other than you're young. Um, for young people, I would say the minute you walk out of school, whether it's from high school into a trade, I don't care. Say 15% of every dollar you make. Now, that's not a hard and fast rule. I would just tell you this, if you do that consistently and you have any reasonable investment strategy, it doesn't have to be fancy, in 20 years, you will be shocked at how much money you have. So then let me, I'm 26 by the way. Okay. Um, so then let me push that a little further because something you have talked a lot about is, as I understand it, the stock market, yes? Yeah. And for, for people... It's the only reasonable place to put your money, in my opinion. Okay. So, but for people like me who, who were not raised, uh, wealthy is not even a, close you don't, to a You word. don't have the background to even probably have ever sniffed anything around investing. No, I, and I don't. And I, yeah. I, for me, it's very confusing. Yeah. So like for, you know, we truly, my dad has money like in a hole, buried in a hole. Yeah. Like that's our version of investment. Which, which by the way, from a, from a financial power perspective is the dumbest thing ever. It feels good. It feels good. No, I, Liz, I get it. Here's the behavioral of it. Right. It feels good. I've got this cash. I can see it. Right. I can touch it. Right. It's like having gold bars. <laughs> it feels good. But you know what's happening to your money? It's getting soggy. Have you heard about this thing called inflation? Yes. So inflation makes your dollar worth a little bit less every year. Two or three percent. On, on average, about 2.9%. That's much higher than I expected. Well, in 24 years, the value of your dollar today, the dollar you have today in 24 years is worth 50 cents. I see. In purchasing power. So you have to invest it. The problem is you got this stock market thing that does all this. The thing about it is over the long haul, it looks just like this. So what I would tell you is, and, and, um, and, I, don't, and, and I don't even know what the VRS looks like in the, the pension planning anymore. We don't get a pension. If so, you're in the 403B. So. Yes. Make a 15% contribution to the 403B, period. Put it in, very simple. You can do one of two things. Put it in the S&P 500 index fund, if you don't mind watching the value go all over the place, or put it in what's called a target date fund. And there'll be something called like retirement 2040 or retirement 2035. Just put it there and then turn your back on it. You put 15% of your money away like that for a long period, when you're probably f between 50 and 55, you'll be able to walk out of teaching and probably pay yourself more out of your investment pile than Chesterfield or Henrico or Hanover or the city of Richmond pays you.
almost as certainly. Well, the county it of really is that pays simple. us nothing. Uh, I'm, well, <laughs> the other thing I would say is, you know, you got all your side gigs. Um, if you have established some sort of business entity like an LLC, you can stand up a retirement plan against that. Okay. And you can save in multiple places tax deferred. Well, we're coming to see you because we're trying to start our LLC. So. Happy to have a conversation. <laughs> Happy to have the conversation. Okay. Um, my team will yell at me because we're busy. I just, <laughs> I'm just not willing to turn somebody down who wants help. So, so that's my next question for our viewers. Who should come see you? How do I know it's time to come see Mark Newfield, real financial advisor? If you don't have a clear picture of where you are financially or where you want to go financially, then you need some advice, period. I don't care who you are. Now, for us, we've been doing this for a long time. I spend most of my time with entrepreneurs and high-income technology executives. That's just where the people I've evolved to see in. That being said, if the two of you wanted to come talk to me, I'm not going to turn you down. I might have one of my teammates help you instead, yeah. just because I only have so many hours in a day. But I'm, it's impossible for me to turn somebody down who, who wants help. Yeah. I would say this. If you're willing to listen to advice, if you are unclear about what your financial picture is and how much you should be saving, then you should be talking to somebody. Make it your father. Make it your brother. Make it your best friend. Talk to somebody. And the other people that we, we tend to do, first of all, everybody I talk to is smart enough to do what I do. There are very few people that just don't understand or can't. They either don't want to devote the time to it or they realize that it makes more sense for a professional to do it than for them to do it themselves. I mean, I've, had three, I've had three knee surgeries. Wow. You think I know something about knee surgery? I do, I promise you, because I'm an analyst. Um, I would no more do my own knee surgery <laughs> than I would put a fully loaded gun in my mouth and pull the trigger. Right. That makes no sense. Let a professional do it. Could I do it? Maybe. <laughs> I, hope not. I don't know. I mean, I maybe. But why? Why? I've had 11 ear surgeries, and I know I could not do that myself. Well, you can't it, even it, see in there. It, it, <laughs> Yeah, with, with this technology, of course you could. Oh, perfect. Of course you could. <laughs> I have a, a question for you, though. You have a child, at least one, that I've heard about. Yeah. And I teach children. And I think the way I was raised was it wasn't like a we don't talk about money household. It oh, was yeah. a you need to go make money now. It is your responsibility. You're seven. Go. Like that was that was the way I was taught. But it wasn't. We didn't talk about the ins and outs of money. We just talked about we need it. Which is a massive flaw it. in our society. So I'm curious. How, how do I talk to my students about money do i have someone you know not you but maybe one of your associates come in and like do a, a thing do, how do i talk to them a we it? could do that b you could you could just come along and say i'm sure there are a couple of very good brief texts that we could give them they sure. probably all spend half their lives on google or similar TikTok, um, i think there's but... so much material out there we could easily flag some material okay but i but I, but what what i would say is i would just put in front of them some sort of money primer. Spend less than you make. Save automatically. Sure. Right? The, it, it is live below your means, but with some just very explicit instructions. When you start working, just save 15% of every dollar you make. Mm -hmm. Now, for many people, that will actually be over saving, but here's what I know. I promise that when I see you 30 years from now, if you saved really effectively, you won't say, I have too much money. Right. You will say, I love the optionality I have now that I have more than I expected. Right. So then I... Uh, so I would say to them, you could do it. You, once you know the principles, why couldn't you lay it out? And you could even describe your own challenges with, you know, here's the money script I grew up with. Right. Everybody has a different one. But my money script wasn't that much different than yours. Right. I had to fend for myself. Yeah. And I didn't learn anything either. I, and I, and I didn't with, learn good money habits. Right. I've developed them over time. Yeah. Because nobody taught me. There's no money gene. There's no savings gene that we're born with. Yeah. I work with mostly low income students, and so they're they're always in that survival mode. Right. And I want to. And how can you talk about stuff when you 
when you don't have a roof over your head or you're not getting food, how can you talk about these things? Well, I think the way you frame it is, look, you want to get out of this? Here's a way out. Yeah. Accumulate enough to get yourself out. Yeah. Here's well, how you do it. I'm planning a whole financial literacy unit in my head. This well, the, the Commonwealth of Virginia is actually fairly well advanced in financial literacy, but our country as a whole is abysmal. Yeah. Um, and and so um, it'd be another thing that I'd be happy to work on on another day, which is how to script that out right. and develop a program that you could deliver now and forever. And, and if it means one of us showing up, you know, once a semester uh, to just talk about the financial universe yeah. and the fundamentals. I do a fundamentals of financial planning uh, seminar for all the athletes at VCU. Wow. And I do that completely pro bono. Yeah. Because guess what? Most of those kids, especially in, the, in, 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 in their biggest sport, basketball, where do you think they come from? My school. Right. I know they come from my school. <laughs> right. Or they come from a similar school in Boston or somewhere. Yeah. What kind of education do you think they've had? One where teachers struggled to pay for our supplies and for right. our room to be clean. and Right, which is another ridiculous thing mm -hmm. uh, that you have to do that out of your own pocket. Mm -hmm. oh, well, the uh, state gives us a, a, a measly $250 a year for it. Oh, yeah. And that buys you, you know, what, 32 pencils in a, in a ream of paper, but uh, 33. 31 pencils. Oh, 31, Okay. <laughs> Uh, but but anyway, the the where do these kids come from? You think they have any education? No. A good number of them, only about 1% of them will get into the NBA, where the huge money is. But a good number of them go overseas and make three or $400,000 a year. Wow. Realistically, if you've come from poverty, you should be saving probably 50% of what you make. Well, if you save 50% of what you make for five years... And you live on 150,000, and you save 150,000. Now, after taxes, you're not saving 150,000; you're saving maybe 110. Well, you've got 600 plus grand laying there. Yeah. And then you come back. Maybe you didn't finish college. Well, now you can. Mm -hmm. You know, you've got something. By the way, if you never touch that money, round numbers. If it's invested properly, every nine years or so, it'll double in value. So, if you've saved 600 grand and you're 27 years old. I have not. <laughs> but if you have, if you were lucky and you're a professional athlete, at 36, you got a million two. At 45, you got two million four. This is called compounding. And it's how you really make money. At 54, you got $4.8 million. Well, that will spin off $200,000 a year, maybe two twenty dollars a year for the rest of your life. Okay. If you can't live on that, shame on you. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's like five times the median income of a family of four in the United States. This is the point, and it's just the same is true for all of us. Yeah. The $30,000 you save in the next two years, if you can do it, nine years later, it's $60,000. Nine years later, it's $120,000. Compounding is where everybody makes money. Warren Buffett was worth, I think, $300 million when he was 65. Well, wow. that's huge money. Yeah. You know what his net worth now is? It's like $40 billion. Jesus Christ. It's compounded. <laughs> No one should He's have that much never money. spent any of that money. So then a central tenet of this program is that we are a community program, right? And so I do, while I don't want to impose value system on anyone, I think people that choose to watch us have a similar value system, which is generosity. Yeah. So how do how does someone like me who makes poultry money, how do I pay reparations? How do I actively work towards being charitable, even though I myself am a charity case? Well, your charity right now is your time. Okay. Right. Well, you're doing it right now, right? You're trying to educate your community mm -hmm. in various forms. I don't know what others of these you've done. Mm -hmm. You are giving your time some portion of it. So folks like me, like low, low middle income or whatever. Well, give your time to what do you give care your time. about. Okay. And then let's say I make it to middle. Let's say I do. Here, I'm going to stop you for a minute. If you don't think it'll happen, I promise you it will Won't. not. That's a good point. There's old Henry Ford, and I'm, I'm, I'm a good example of it. Because when I was your age, I was you. I was a college sophomore when I was 26. Wow. I was living 
where is it, 3915 West, West Grace, underneath the TV tower? Yeah. I know we exactly to, where that is. We had to put plastic on the windows to stop the drafts in the winter. And I carried, I kept, I bought boric acid at Heckinger. You're, you're not old enough. The, the equivalent of Lowe's at the time to kill the roaches. And it would spread it around the floor every couple of weeks. And here, I mean, believe me, I, I drive a car that I shouldn't drive. If you had told me we'd be having this conversation and I would be where I am, you know, 37 years later, I'd say you're out of your mind. So whatever you believe you can be is a big factor in whether you are that or not. Right. So the first, this goes back to our original conversation around this is mostly about behavior and not about money. Yeah. You have to first believe that you're going to change your circumstances. So if you want to give back, help people believe they can change their circumstances then point them to the tools that will help them do it. Because I think as you well know, however well-intentioned our government programs are, they thank you for the rolling of the eye, they don't <laughs> work very effectively. It's just a fact. I mean, the city of Richmond has the highest per capita spending on education in the, in the, uh, in the school system. And the, the, the lowest- Retention rate. Retention and education rate. Yep. It's not that there's an inverse proportion. It's that the programs aren't very effective. Yeah. So help make those programs more effective. You're in a position to do it. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I don't have your job. Right. A different thing. I, um, but I do give charitably for that reason because I can afford to. Right. And where I give it is in college, mm -hmm. in college scholarship money. Well, I didn't have scholarship money. It made it awfully hard right. to get through. And school was a hell of a lot cheaper then. Yes, it was. <laughs> so that's where I can provide leverage. And if I can pay for every year one or two people who deserve to be in school, who want to do well, but can't afford it, I don't know how much more change I could make. That's amazing. That's just why we've chosen to do what we do. And we only give to a couple charities. We give to VCU and Children's Home Society. And if you've ever seen the state of foster children in the Commonwealth of Virginia, it's, you probably deal with them. I teach them, yeah. It's, it's hideously bad. Awful. And what happens when they, when they turn 17 and they get booted out of the foster program? Yeah. They end up in two places, three. They're in jail, they're in pregnant, or they're dead. And or they're New all York poor. City. They, for whatever reason, all of my foster kiddos are now in New York City. It's very strange. I don't know how. They live on the street. Obviously. Right. Yeah. But, uh... <laughs> so they're either going to end up in jail <laughs> in New York City <laughs> or dead or pregnant in some form of the other two. Yeah. If they're female. It's, it's hideous. Yeah. It's unbelievably bad. Well, we I think we have surpassed our hour, honestly. But um, our last question uh, on the show that I love asking is how can I take your special knowledge and share it with my neighbor today? What what nugget can I give to my neighbors, both metaphorical and physical, from your specific knowledge base today? Very simply, you want to be financially healthy, spend less than you make. I love it. It's that simple. Your messaging is very clear. <laughs> spend less than you make. Sure. Okay. And then for the last couple minutes, uh, all you, tell us how we find you, how we get your services, and what's new on the horizon for you. Well, I'll start with the last one. What's new on the high horizon is we, we separated out from the big firm we were a part of, and we set up an independent firm in September. Congratulations. So uh, for us, that means that we have actually lowered the cost of services we deliver and improved the quality of them. Huh. Um, you know, where you find us, um, on the web, it's bleaklyva.com, and that's B-L-E-A-K-L-E-Y-V-A.com. That's probably the easiest way to find us. You can message us through our website, blah, blah, blah. Right. Um, you know, and I would say to you, if, if you think we can be of help, feel free to give us a call. And we'll have a conversation. I, I will always have 15 minutes for somebody who wants to improve their life. Sure. Okay. Well, you heard it here. BleaklyVA.com. That's it. Well, thank you very much for talking and helping us, or helping me get out of my wheelhouse of understanding. <laughs> we appreciate it. Well, the fact of the matter is, right, if this was, it, it, everybody has an area of interest and expertise, mm -hmm. right? And you should leverage that from everybody you know. 
Everybody has something. Yeah. If you find it and use it and spread it, we'll live in a better place. And what's wrong with that? <laughs>